For the past 60 years, evolutionists have been pushing plate tectonics on the public. They claim that at about 250 million years ago, all continents were joined in a single supercontinent that we now call Pangaea. What they don't tell you is that they have to disregard all of Mexico to make them fit. They claim that the oceanic crust is being formed in mid-ocean ridges and subsequently destroyed via an unobserved process called subduction. They make up the idea of polar reversals by simply drawing an imaginary line where they feel magnetism has been weaker in the past and use it as evidence that the world is old. Yet still, their imaginary theory cannot explain fracture zones in the mid-ocean ridges nor the formation of deep sea trenches. How can they not see how bankrupt their theory really is. I had to investigate. Plate tectonics has its origin in the simple observation that the east coast of the Americas roughly matches the west coasts of Europe and especially Africa. It is impossible to determine who first made this observation, but the first known case of it being published was by Flemish, Netherlandish cartographer and geographer Abraham Ortelius, who published his work Thesaurus Geographicus in 1587. He hypothesized that the Americas were torn away from Europe and Africa by earthquakes and floods, and suggested that the vestiges of the rupture reveal themselves with even a a small degree of examination. Over the next few centuries, many models were proposed to explain this apparent fit, but all of them were hindered by the intuitive assumption that the planet was completely solid through and through. In January of 1896, Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen's discovery of X-rays caused a great deal of excitement in the scientific community, especially in Henry Becquerel's experiments with phosphorescence. Noticing that samples of uranium left images on photographic plates, Becquerel assumed that uranium was phosphorescent, absorbing photons from the sun and releasing them. Assuming that uranium would cease to emit any particles after extended periods of total darkness, he was surprised to discover that uranium salt continued emitting particles unfettered whether or not it was exposed to sunlight. He determined that the emissions he was detecting came from the uranium salt itself. Subsequent experiments performed by him, Ernest Rutherford, Paul Villard, Pierre Curie, Marie Curie, and others established that Becquerel had discovered a new physical phenomenon called radiation. When an unstable atom releases a particle, this emission is accompanied by a release of heat. Until the discovery of radioactivity, calculations on the age of the Earth and its features relied on the observation and measurement of environmental and geological processes. The discovery of radioactive material ejecting from volcanoes led scientists to realize that the interior of the planet was radioactive and would, therefore, require far longer to cool than their previous calculations had determined. This also meant that the interior of the Earth was likely fluid, which explained volcanism worldwide. The fluidity of Earth's mantle eventually gave rise to speculation on the potential movement of continents. The idea of continental drift was given new life in a presentation by Alfred Wegener on January 6, 1912. Beside demonstrating the more perfect fit of the continental shelves as opposed to modern coastlines, Wegener pointed out the continuity of geological features from one plate to another when aligned according to their shapes and proximity. For example, the Appalachian mountain chain in the eastern United States forms a continuous mountain chain to the Scottish Highlands to the Greenland and Scandinavian Caledonides. Likewise, the Brazilian the Santa Catarina geological system continues along the southern tip of Africa as the Karoo system and then continues on into Antarctica. Wegener also noticed the distribution of specific fossils which also line up in a continuous pattern when the plates are aligned. For example, Mesosaurus, which was a Permian reptile. Its fossils are found only in South Africa and eastern South America. Cynognathus, a Triassic mammal-like reptile. Its fossils are found only in South Africa and South America. Lystrosaurus, an herbivorous Triassic reptile. Its fossils are only found in Antarctica, India, and South Africa. Even plant fossils show the same continuous pattern of distribution. Like Glossopterus, a woody Permian seed-bearing tree only found in a continuous pattern spanning Australia, Antarctica, India, South Africa, and South America. Not only is it rather coincidental that these fossils happen to appear geographically in patterns of distribution that are only continuous when the continents are lined up, but they are also currently separated by oceans which would be vastly too far to traverse. In spite of all this evidence, there was still no known mechanism for continental drift, so the theory remained an intriguing yet unviable model. Incidentally, the expanding Earth hypothesis was also offered as a model for the previous conjugation of the continents, but this also failed due to a lack of a mechanism to explain it. 
A clue to the mechanism for continental drift, however, would come from the relatively new field of paleomagnetism. For centuries, mariners were aware that compasses deviate near magnetic outcroppings. Ship's logs recorded these deviations over time, leading scientists to examine magnetism in oceanic basalts, noticing that most basalts contained magnetites, which ran parallel to the Earth's magnetic field. Magnetites are magnetically polarized bits of iron, which appear in almost all igneous and metamorphic rocks, and notably liquid magma. When liquid magma reaches Earth's surface and is deposited, the magnetites contained within align with the direction of Earth's North Pole. As the magma cools to become basalt, it hardens and records that direction. On occasion, some basalts had been discovered with a directly opposite polarity, pointing south instead of north. This opposite polarity was mysterious until 1926 when Japanese geophysicist Motonori Matuyama began collecting basaltic specimens throughout Manchuria and Japan. Publishing his findings in 1929 in the Proceedings of the Imperial Academy of Japan, he discovered that the polarity of basalts correlated to the strata in which they were found, indicating that the North and South Poles had flipped at least twice in Earth's history. Subsequent findings around the world have all corroborated these and several other polar shifts. Meanwhile, as seismographs became more and more accurate and prominent, scientists were able to more accurately record, measure, and locate earthquakes around the world. Seismologists such as Kyo Wadati of Japan and Hugo Benioff of the United States were, independently, the first to recognize that earthquakes tend to be concentrated in specific areas, most notably along the oceanic trenches, but also along spreading ridges and typically extending several hundred kilometers into the earth. These zones became known as Wadati Benioff zones and they outlined the sliding of discrete plates along and against each other. In 1947, a team led by Maurice Ewing using the research vessel Atlantis from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution confirmed the existence of a rise in the central Atlantic Ocean. Finding that the oceanic crust was thinner than continental crust, they also confirmed that the seabed beneath ocean sediments was comprised of basalt as opposed to granite, which generally comprises continental plates. This led to further mapping of the ocean floor and the discovery of what came to be known as the Great Global Rift. Observing that the continuous chain of ridges straddled a deep fissure, Bruce Heason published his paper, The Rift in the Ocean Floor, in the October 1960 issue of Scientific American, and detailed the process of a new seafloor being formed by the regular eruption of magma in the rifts, creating a new seafloor and pushing the older seafloor away. Also of note is that the density of the seafloor plate becomes denser away from the ridges due to being compacted as it spreads away from its origin. In 1961, a team led by Ron G. Mason published a paper in the Geological Society of America Bulletin. The results of their magnetic survey of the ocean floor revealed a zebra-like pattern of normally and reversely polarized rock originating from the ocean ridges. Known as magnetic striping, these variations in polarity corresponded to the stratigraphic polarity changes observed by Motonori Motoyama 35 years before. Later expanded upon independently by Fred Vine and Drummond Matthews, as well as by Lawrence Morley, this confirmed the work of Heason, but Heason felt it was evidence for an expanding Earth, since no mechanism had been observed for a destruction of the seafloor that approximated the rate at which the new seafloor was being created. At about this same time, Harry Hammond Hess, a Princeton University geologist, along with Robert Dietz, a marine geologist, geophysicist, and oceanographer from the U.S. Coast and Genetic Survey, both proposed the concept of subduction, a phenomenon wherein the lighter granitic plates floated on top of the basaltic plates, pushing them downward into the mantle to become fluid again. Hess specifically cited convection currents in the mantle as the mechanism fueling this process, being a pattern of circulation from the core boundary to the upper mantle. In 1962, American geologist Robert Coates published his observations of subduction in the Aleutian Arc in the journal Geophysics. It was among the first of countless papers detailing the detection of earthquakes deep within the crust along the paths of subduction zones. This culminated in 2013, when Marco Pils, Stefano Parolai, and Dino Bindi published the results of their experiments using a passive seismic sonar in a technique that might resemble an ultrasound, but on a grander scale. The result was a three-dimensional image of the Lysik Atta Fault in Kyrgyzstan and a visual confirmation of the process of subduction. The theories of plate tectonics and continental drift have been officially vindicated. An interesting detail about subduction is that on the upper, non-subducting plate, volcanoes are very common, within 100 miles of the subduction zone. This is because as the seafloor subducts, it also takes seawater downward. As the seawater reaches warmer and warmer depths, it begins to filter upward into the heated rocks above where its lighter density reduces the melting point. 
This causes the surrounding rocks to melt and push upward, eventually breaking the surface and erupting. The most dramatic example of this is the area encircling the Pacific Ocean, known as the Ring of Fire. Also in this model, and observed seismically, when two basalt plates collide, the older and therefore denser plate subducts below the younger plate, causing a deep rift known as a trench. For example, the Pacific Plate, which travels at a rate of 7 centimeters per year, converges and subducts at the Mariana Plate, forming the Mariana Trench. Meanwhile, when two granite plates collide, being both lighter, they do not subduct, but rather compress and push upward, forming mountains. The most dramatic example of this is where the Indian Plate, traveling at a rate of 5 centimeters per year, pushes northward against the Eurasian Plate. The result is a fault known as the main central thrust, where the land is being pushed up at a rate of roughly 1 centimeter per year. This forms the Himalayas, including Mount Everest. Although there are many earthquakes along this fault, because it is the convergence of two continental plates and devoid of subduction, there are no volcanoes in this area. Meanwhile, at the oceanic ridges, the divergent fault moves at different rates depending on which area's volcanic activity is occurring at any given time. As one area experiences more pressure to diverge, a transform fault appears in the seafloor, allowing it to move more freely from the ocean ridge in relation to the surrounding seafloor. This leaves behind what is known as a fracture zone. Local variances in continental drift and subduction rate, along with fault slippage, also has the effect of warping the shapes of the continent continental plates via earthquake. A very minor example of this is the curb on the corner of Rose and Prospect in Hayward, California that has been slowly offsetting along the Hayward Fault over the past 50 years. A more dramatic example is this fault slippage which occurred during a single earthquake in 1992. These kinds of local distortions over time are more than capable of warping, stretching, and compacting the geography of a continent like we see in the case of Mexico. Incidentally, Mexico is also where some of the most intense and destructive earthquakes in recorded history have occurred. Until recently, plate tectonics had only been observed on Earth. In recent years, plate tectonics has been observed on Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Titan. In August of 2012, An Yin, a professor at UCLA, published his observations of the Valle Marineris fault zone on Mars in the journal Lithosphere using data from satellite imaging and from NASA's Mars Global Surveyor. He discovered that Mars does indeed have at least two tectonic plates. The theory of continental drift and plate tectonics faced immense opposition from the outset. Its acceptance by scientists was hard fought and in spite of more popular models. Even when its predictions were confirmed, the scientific consensus was slow to embrace it. This is the brutal process that all good theories go through and must survive before they trickle into public school textbooks. And this is the process that hydroplate theory and creationism in general seek to avoid. Their proponents choosing instead to attempt legislating their untested propositions positions into the classroom. But still, this is yet another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.